Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great honor and a pleasure for me to be here at the Pontifical Academy. This has been a long-standing ambition of mine to be with you all. In fact, I did get an invitation once a couple of years ago uh, when I was the chief economic advisor to the Indian government and it happened to coincide with the Indian budget when you people were having your meeting. And I was very tempted to come, but I knew that I would be sacked from my job if during the budget I came away to the Pontifical Academy, so I could not. I also have to say that uh, for me this is um, particularly personally um, important because of my education in a a Catholic school in Calcutta, very progressive Catholic school. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm very dear to my own school. And another association, uh, which I have to say here is, uh, means a lot to me, um, my sister used to work very closely with Mother Teresa in Calcutta. And through her, I had um, two interactions with Mother Teresa. Um, and these are very memorable. I know she has been controversial and people have criticized, but I also know that my sister, um, who is a skeptic and a non-believer, but having worked with Mother Teresa, she said that she felt that from her there was nothing but a huge amount of compassion and love for human beings. And that was more overwhelming than anything else. I should tell you of one particular incident and I'll plunge into my topic. Uh, my sister one morning had reached Mother Teresa's school to work with her when there was a Hindu-Muslim riot and fighting going on in Calcutta. This was in the 60s. And the rioting was quite serious. There were deaths in slums that had taken place when Mother Teresa said that I am actually going into one of the slums where there is a Hindu-Muslim rioting going on. Please come with me. My sister said that her first emotion was to run away and not go into a slum where there is fighting going on. But she did not have the courage to say no to Mother Teresa. So she went with Mother Teresa in this van into this very poor area. And she said it was an amazing sight to see Hindus and Muslims who were carrying sticks and stones and swords, whatever they could get, this was old fashioned fighting, seeing Mother Teresa's van come in, both sides dropped everything from their hands and they were bowing to the van because of the sheer power of the presence of the kind of emotions she brought into the terrain. So that is the reason why for me, this invitation when it came was very, very special, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be here. There is another reason why this is special. Uh, child labor and child education is a topic that has been of very close interest of mine. And for a long stretch of time, I did a lot of copious research, very academic research, into the field of child labor, child education, child well-being. I was at the World Bank 16 years ago. I had come as a visitor. And there is extensive research going on in the bank. I had worked with them, collaborated with a particular person called Zafiris Zanatos. But my first introduction to this topic of child welfare took place in a very unusual way. I had just moved to the United States from India in 1994. And there was a debate raging in the US about banning child labor immediately everywhere. And in particular, there was a bill called the Harkins Bill, which was in consideration in the US for, uh, for being adopted. I felt from my experience in India that the popular American perception, all very well-meaning, was however misplaced. If you read the documents of the American legislation, there were two reasons being given for the widespread prevalence of child labor. 
reason number one was greed and profit by entrepreneurs. They want the cheapest labor possible, and so they turn to children as the labor that they would employ. That was reason number one. Reason number two was laziness and sloth on the part of the parents who would rather send their children out to work than work themselves. I felt that the first assumption had some truth. The second assumption was not true at all. When you have child labor as a mass phenomenon, as indeed it is the case even today, today there are 168 million children working in the world between the age of five and 17, basically less than 17, 168 million children working. It was much worse earlier. But when you have child labor as a mass phenomenon, to say that it's the laziness of the children as a factor is wrong. Usually the children are desperate, and in a desperate situation, you push your children out to work. Yes, there are a few exceptions. The world is a diverse place. But for a vast majority of parents, it is the ultimate extreme situation which makes them make their, send their children to work. So I picked up the pen, and the only time I've written an article for New York Times, I wrote an article and New York Times took it because I objected to the American bill. I said that I understand it's coming from a good desire for a better world, but one part of the assumption is wrong. And if you want to put an end to child labor, you cannot just with a stroke of pen say that from tomorrow no children will work. If you do that, you will probably cause, maybe child labor will end, but child starvation will increase. And these households will be in much greater suffering if you suddenly legislate. If you want to put an end to child labor, there is hard work involved. You have to provide schooling for the children. You have to provide better jobs for the parents. The main reason children work is when parents don't find any other option. If you provide them with decent jobs, they will not send their children to work because a vast majority of parents don't want to send their children to work. So I wrote a short article in the New York Times, which got picked up all around. And in fact, there was um, Senator Harkins wrote a letter on 5th of December 1994, attacking my position. And I have to say, when a senator attacks you, you feel very honored. <laughs> so I was very pleased. Uh, to buy that, and I got engaged in the debate, and subsequently with a Vietnamese-American student of mine, Pham Huang Van, I got into this field doing research. I was also, as I said, after that, there's been a long association in the World Bank where there is a lot of work, and in other places I have done work. I should tell you, I'm just very pleased that the Pontifical Academy has taken this topic up there is a lot of research around the world, but there is research in Italy. There is um, Furio Rosati in Rome doing work on this. There is Mario Bigheri in Flor Florence doing work on this. And if this is taken seriously, given the moral authority of the Vatican and this particular pope who has a great amount of respect around the world, we can begin to make a much bigger difference than we have done thus far. But let me go back to the problem and give you a little bit of the history and where we ha have come today. As I said, the latest count is something like 168 million children working around the world, which is 10.6% of the children from the age of 5 to 17. So of that age group, 10.6% happen to be working today. So child labor, the brief number, you can keep it with you, is 10.6%, which is a great improvement compared to where we were in the past. So 1950, in China, child labor was 48%. In India, it was 35%. In 1860, in UK, child labor was 
after 1860, it started going down. So we've seen a history of very high child labor. It's come down, but you know, with 168 million people, there isn't very much comfort you can draw. And if the battle against child labor started in the early 19th century in Britain, then it's also a bit of a telling commentary on us in the world that after more than 100 years, much more than 100 years, we still have 168 million child, child laborers. So this is something that we need to turn to and do something about. But a little bit on the historical work. You know, a human mindset is such a strange thing that things that you take to be a norm can change dramatically over a short period through moral leadership. There is literature from 1750s, 1760s in Britain where child labor is treated as something normal and something in fine in many ways. There is a very interesting document where a gentleman called John Wyatt has invented a new machine, a, some kind of a spinning machine. There are lots of machines which were being invented. And in applying for a patent, he points out that the great advantage of this machine is you can dismiss 100 adults and employ 30 children and do the same job with them. And the British judge who was looking into the patent was very impressed and said that actually children five years, six years old can do the job of adults. This is such a good machine that I will give the patent to this. But that view began to change. Fortunately, by 1802, in Britain, you have Robert Peel's first Factories Act, where you're begin beginning to take some steps against child labor. 1831 to 1832, over a two-year period, there was, in Britain, a special committee was set up, a parliamentary committee, to investigate child labor because this was such an evil, and children were being deprived from getting basic education. In many years ago, when I used to spend a lot of time doing this kind of research, the British parliamentary papers are huge. But if you read through this, there are interviews of people who had spent their childhood working round the clock, doing nothing else but working. And some of these are heartrending. I will just read out literally three questions that this committee was asking a person called Peter Smart. Peter Smart was a working class person in Britain. He had spent his, spent his entire childhood working. So the question, this is a parliamentary committee. Question, what were your hours of labor in that mill? Clearly, Peter Smart misunderstands the question and his answer is, in the summer season, we were very scarce of water. The parliamentary committee comes back and says, but when you had sufficient water, how long did you work? Peter Smart's answer, we began at 4 o'clock in the morning and worked till 10 and 11 at night. As long as we could stand upon our feet. And this is Peter Smart answering, but this is thousands and thousands of children doing the same. The question, you could hardly keep up for that length of time. Answer, no, we often fell asleep. This was life. You wake up at 4, you begin work at 4, you continue to, till night. And there have been pockets around the world even now today where child labor is excruciating and this problem has continued on and on and on. What do you do about it? What is the impact on education that this has on children and their future? It's true that when you're working, you're not studying, you're not building up human capital that we economists talk about. But this has huge long-run effects. There has been a lot of research on the effect of child labor, on child skills, educational skills, etc. But you know, we economists fuss a lot about what causes what. So there are studies, there is a study by Christel Dumas 
on Senegal, in, from Senegal. Uh, this is a paper published in 2012. There's study by Bezerra, Anna Kassouf, Mary Arendt Squenning on Brazil. Study by Victoria Gunnarsson, Peter Oradzen, Mario Sanchez in Latin America. All showing correlation between child labor, even a couple of hours of work per day, and the human capital formation. But one question which economists would immediately ask is, you know, which way does the causality go? Often parents do, parents in very poor households are forced to make this choice. If you can send only one child to work and one child to school, you very often choose the child who is anyway more capable of schooling to send to school. So you may get a false correlation that those who work are not very good intellectually, so you feel the work is doing the harm, whereas actually it's the parents who have chosen to send that child to school. Fortunately, there is a very nice study done by, in this case I have to say I'm a bit partial to the study because two of the co uh, three co-authors are students of mine. Uh, Andre Portela Souza, uh, Vladimir Ponchek, and Patrick Emerson did a wonderfully controlled study in Brazil where after you do the controls, and I will not go into the details of the research, that is what I do for my um, bread and butter, but simply the final result is that damage is just huge. Of children doing work, the long run human capital build up capacity goes down. Not only, of course, when you are working and going to school, you suffer a lot in your schooling. Their account is in Brazil, on average, it's like missing 25% of your class. But that's the immediate effect. The long run effect on cognition, mental powers is very large. So you are, the damage is done for long. What do you do about this? Well, the, it's an open end and you need a combination of research intellectual skills with activism from people and groups that are genuinely concerned about the problem. You know, I once did one little bit of hands-on research, not very well controlled, so I would never be able to publish that research because econometricians would say it's not well controlled. But the way I did it was my sisters, two of my sisters, and one I mentioned already, they run a school in Calcutta for slum children. And I thought I'll take advantage of the fact that they run a school and do a little bit of survey of the school children and give them aptitude tests. And so what they were made to do was these school children were given very simple questions in logic puzzles, puzzles as simple as can be. A few questions, general knowledge questions, general knowledge questions like, what is the name of the Indian Prime Minister? Which in an Indian school you would expect the children to know. The answers were nice and funny at times. Uh, the children had taken them. I was very interested in associations as to children who do better in school, better in math skill, arithmetic skill, what are the drivers? Three yes, sure. And the drivers you soon discover when you do this study are not the usual ones, but again, if the children are, one thing which turned out very important, if there is conversation at home, if the parents talk to you or your foster parents, many of these children were with foster parents, if they chat with you, it does something to your mind. I think it makes you feel more comfortable as a human being and it makes you perform better. So there are all kinds of unusual drivers of the formation of human capital. So this is a large topic and there is a lot to say. If you have questions, I'll go into more, but all I will say in the end, since I've run out of time, is that I'm so very happy that this important topic in the world is of interest to a body like the Pontifical Academy. There are, I know, similar groups, dedicated groups around the world. If there is a push that comes from here, and at the World Bank, we collect data. If there's nothing else we do, we collect data from all around the world. We can try to put the effect, all these efforts together and maybe make another small dent into this big challenge that the world has. Thank you very much.